Welcome. Can everyone hear me well enough? Okay. Five years. How many of you have been here for all five years of the conference? Awesome. What's, what's the matter with the rest of you? No, I'm kidding. So five years of open source citizenship has taught us many things. We have learned that our, work our open source work benefits not only from sharing what we're doing, but from active cross-pollination and an eager desire to learn from others. We've learned that when we create an environment where everyone can participate, new and more diverse voices join in. This aids in our efforts to share and learn across different backgrounds, perspectives, and groups. We've learned that mentoring, training, and other focused education efforts help new developers and other contributors to join us by creating defined pathways for learning and participating as a newcomer. We've learned that these two are skills that we can cultivate and share. When we continue to encourage and support new people, they take on more responsibility and shape what happens next. This is what keeps our open source work vibrant and alive. That's why we're looking forward to our next five years of open source citizenship and many more to come after that. I'm so thrilled to introduce our first keynote speaker, James Vasil. James has a wealth of experience bootstrapping free software organizations, including Freedom Box Foundation, Open Source Matters, and the Software Freedom Conservancy. Currently, James is director at the Open Internet Tools Project, which supports development of anti-censorship and anti-surveillance tools, and a senior fellow at the Software Freedom Law Center. When he's not busy doing all of that, James advises businesses on open source issues as a partner at Open Tech Strategies. James is passionate about growing the free software community, sharing its gains more widely, and helping people to understand how new technology affects privacy and security in everyday life. Welcome, James. I think that's the best introduction I've ever had. <laughs> Thank you. So congratulations to Open Source Bridge on uh, five years of awesome conference work and gathering this community together. I've been hearing about this conference for a minute now, and it's really great to actually get a chance to come here and see all of you people and hopefully eventually meet and talk to you. Um, whenever I come to do a talk at a new place, I try to figure out who's in the room. And I want to start by sort of asking people here, you know, you're all here to work on open source issues and advocacy issues and code projects and things like that. And I'm wondering what kinds of people we have in this room. So with a, just a show of hands, you know, who here identifies as an open source developer? So most of you. And, and who here's primary engagement with free and open source software projects is as a translator? How about a person who writes documentation? Awesome. <laughs> End user support? Awesome. That is, that is great. And I'll, I'll sort of return to that later. And, and there's a reason why I want to know who's here and what you guys are doing. Because one of the things that I'm going to try to talk a little bit about is where free and open source software is and what kinds of things we need to um, work on to take it to the next level. Now, my work currently is really in the area of privacy and security, especially uh, for people in difficult places trying to do difficult things. And the work I do is with the Open Internet Tools Project, which is essentially a support organization for people making free software, anti-censorship, and anti-surveillance technology. And we do that in a variety of ways, but all of our work is really designed to figure out how to make free software projects that do circumvention better. We want to make those projects more successful. And so we do things to build community and to develop skills and to provide resources. And one of the things we do, obviously, is talk about what's in the news right now. So in the news right now, you all have heard recently, I'm sure, about the revelations from Edward Snowden, the, all the articles that Glenn Greenwald has written, all of the stuff that's come out of the Washington Post and the New York Times and the Guardian about where we are now that we know that the NSA 
has been reading our email and listening to our phone calls and all of that other stuff. I'm pretty sure that somewhere the NSA has a list of all the socks I've ever lost in my dryer, right? <laughs> like that's the level, you know, and I, I just wish they would tell me, right? <laughs> make, this, make all of this surveillance somewhat useful to me and I, I might be willing to accept it because that's the model we've built our, our online society on, right? As long as you make surveillance convenient to me, <laughs> I will accept just about anything, right? So the day someone comes up with a really convenient colonoscopy, there will be a line out the door. <laughs> Essentially, the NSA problem is, is, is one of, of marketing. They need a little more Web 2.0 to, to make it easier. Right? They, need, they need to make the social network that they're building behind our backs sort of useful to us. And once they do that, we'll, we'll completely roll over and, and give them all the data they want. So that, you know, this is the environment we're currently in. And we've sort of watched stuff unfold both here and you know, there's, there's been a lot of recent news in Iran. Um, I don't know how much, how closely people are following that, but Iran just had an election. In the run-up to the election, the standard sort of filtering of the internet and censoring of connections and digital attacks that the Iranian government n sort of normally engages in was taken up a notch um, to help control the, the message and the, the social activity around electioneering and all that kind of stuff. So, we learned some, some stuff for that, and I want to talk to you briefly about what that looks like. So this talk is about some of these lessons that we learned and what this means for free and open source software, the environment that we're in. So we are living in a world that is increasingly hostile to people on a technological level, right? Our technological environment is increasingly hostile to our privacy, our security, our ability to communicate with each other in secure ways in anonymous ways, in ways that make us feel comfortable saying what we really need to say and organizing in the ways that we really want to organize. It's hard to build communities that can do work that is um, fighting traditional power structures if those power structures have designed the communication systems to make your organizing difficult and to give them information that allows them to disrupt your networks. And so that's where we are, as people who build open technology, this should really scare us, right? We build communications technology. That's pretty much what all of open soft source software is. Every single thing you do is, is directed at making something to share with somebody else, some sort of communication payload. And understanding the ways in which this environment is getting more hostile is the first step to understanding um, how we can fix it and what we can do about it. So if you look at the ways in which people get burned by technology. It turns out that the, the, the technology we have, the encryption we have, seems to be working pretty well, right? When you encrypt something, it kind of stays encrypted, it, it, as far as we know, right? We don't, see a lot of, we don't see a lot of obvious instances of somebody encrypting something and then um, having that encryption getting broken, right? Our current encryption technology looks pretty good right now. So when Iran wanted to start you know, when forces in Iran wanted to start doing more activity around controlling the message in um, the election season, their, their attack wasn't to, you know, brute force keys, right? The attack in Iran was things like a lot more phishing. Phishing activity went, went way up. And this was an attempt to sort of gain control of, of websites and communications infrastructure. DDoS attacks went way up. Right, and that's, that's a, a very typical sort of way to silence your opposition. The firewall, the national firewall between Iran and the rest of the world got way more picky about what kind of traffic it would let through. In particular, the traffic that it decided not to let through anymore was VPN traffic. And for a long time, VPNs have been the tool of choice for activists in difficult places, in censored places, who want a little bit of privacy and access to the outside world. So if you are in Iran trying to do either activist work or just lead an uncensored life, a VPN is part of your arsenal. It is, your, it is the main tool in your box for talking to the outside world. Same thing in China. If you're in China and you want to read a censored New York Times article, you fire up a VPN as, as the first thing you're going to try to read that uh, New York Times article. But the big lesson that we learned in the last few weeks is that VPNs that only work when the government lets them work 
are not circumvention tools. You're not circumventing censorship at that point. You're using a tool that the government has decided you're allowed to use. And then as soon as things got hard, as soon as people needed to do communication in earnest during an important moment in the civil life of Iran, they lost that tool. The VPNs were shut down. So in, in a lot of places, particularly Iran and China, people talk about VPNs as the solution to problems and rolling out more VPNs, better VPNs, free VPNs for lots of people to use. And all of those VPNs exist purely because governments are willing to let that traffic through the firewall. And there, there are economic reasons that sort of contribute to them wanting to let that traffic through. But, it's, but then when times get hard, they cut it off. And if we live in a world where we can only talk when times are good, we're going to have a lot of trouble when times are bad. So VPNs are not the answer. That was one of the big lessons. We need other tools, more tools, better tools. We need new kinds of open source software that is going to address the fact that VPNs are not the solution to the problem, like a lot of people have been saying for many years. The increasingly hostile technology environment includes threats like phishing, includes threats like DDoS. I think in the next year or two, we're going to discover that includes things, threats like massive amounts of facial recognition software being run on all those security cameras that we were perfectly OK with everyone installing because we wanted more convenient safety and the ability to protect the city center and all that other kind of stuff. Once we started agreeing to allow security cameras in every block, hooking that, up, that stuff up to software became kind of a no-brainer. Now that we've got the software to do facial recognition, that will be the next giant database that we will all be outraged about five years from now, maybe sooner. The other thing we learned in the last few weeks is that traditionally, our interactions with government produced public records, right? We, it never really scared us or surprised us that governments can cross-reference records from different agencies, right? It never really bothered us that the IRS and the DMV can talk occasionally, right? Those are public records. Those are government records. We expect that stuff to get used for government purposes. We expect that data to move around within government agencies to a degree. We sort of assume that governments are incompetent at moving that data around, <laughs> but, but when they get it right, we're like, okay, yeah, that, that's okay, I understand. You, you had my data, you used it. But the big lesson that we learned recently is there's a whole new layer of interaction with the world that is now getting added to the public data, right? And this is corporate interaction. Suddenly, all of our interactions with the largest communications infrastructure companies around are part of that data set in a very visible way. So adding that layer to the threat model of, OK, every time I use a computer, I'm talking to a, a, a corporate website in the daily course of going out about my life and Facebooking people. When I do that, I'm creating data. And that data gets centralized and, and, and added to the massive government data that's out there. So this is the multivariate threat, right? In each place, you have different kinds of threat. Let's talk for a moment about what the response to that threat has been, which is to build tools that include encrypted communication, that allow people to talk directly to each other and have their communication in that manner. But none of those tools address the phishing, the DDoS, the facial recognition, the fact that when you use the corporate websites, you're basically giving up your data. So all of the current free and open source software efforts, I shouldn't say all, but many of the current free and open source software efforts that are designed to protect our privacy and our security are focused on this one narrow band of the problem of how do you, how do you send an encrypted message between two people. That, I'm going to argue, is a big chunk of the reason why we don't have effective tools. Now, we're starting to see more effective tools, tools that do these other things. There are people working on, on DDoS stuff. There's a project called Deflect that does that pretty good. There's a, a browser plugin called Ghostery that will remove all the trackers as you, as you go through the internet. I highly recommend it. Um, you know, you can, you can start using search engines like DuckDuckGo or StartPage to keep your searches out of the, the Google database. You can close your Facebook account and go back to the old social networking we used to do that we called IRC and email. And you know, I'm sure a lot of people in this room have used IRC and use it, use it a lot. I'm sure everyone here uses email. But if you do that on your server and not Google's server, 
you gain a privacy advantage, right? So this sort of, these steps that we can take that, that we're just now realizing have to be comprehensive across so many different technologies and across so many different threats is the new challenge. That is the piece that we need to figure out how to do next. Because right now, our messaging around, I'm gonna send you an encrypted message and you're going to send me an encrypted message, creates a ton of metadata about the fact of communication and the time of communication. And another big lesson that has been all over the news recently is that if you have enough metadata, you don't need the content of communication. You don't need to know what people said to know what they talked about, or even to know what the end result of the phone call was. Right? And if you, if you don't believe me, think about the news when Tiger Woods, right? Tiger Woods got in a lot of trouble because he slept with a lot of different women that weren't his wife. And there was tons of information about what those text messages that he was sending with these various women contained. But the most quickest way to sort of identify what was going on was saying, yeah, that dude, he sent 3,000 text messages to this, to this one woman in the middle of the night, right? At all times of day and night. You don't need to know, you don't need to read the text messages to understand that the nature of that relationship is intimate, is closer, is, is not a, a proper relationship for him to be having. So you don't need to read the contents of email. And if he had encrypted all of those text messages, he would be no better off today than he was. He would not, he would not have gained any significant privacy advantage from layering encryption on top of his illicit communication. All he would have done was created you know, a layer of speculation that people would have been able to draw conclusions from. We are doing the same thing at the governmental level with regard to suspected criminals and terrorists and citizens, right? Echelon, Echelon started back in the Thatcher administration, right? America, New Zealand, Canada, the UK, Australia, started trying to gather up all of the, the, the signals around the world and put them in a database for analysis. And a lot of that was metadata analysis. Today, we use metadata to figure out who we should kill with flying robots. Right? This, welcome to the future, man. I mean, this is, this is, this is enough, there's enough info in metadata that we feel confident that we can identify people strongly enough and badly enough that we can go and decide to kill them and everyone who happens to be standing near them, just from metadata. When you, talk to, when you read, read articles about drone strikes, there's something called a signature strike. The signature in signature strike is your metadata signature. It is the penumbra of information around the content of your communication that tells people in the, in the government, in our government, enough about you that they can make a decision as to whether you should live or you should die. That's metadata. So we now know metadata is hugely important. Metadata is just as good as having the content of your communication. Despite that, the same people who believe that metadata is hugely important are also advocating for use of GPG to encrypt email. GPG is a great technology. It will encrypt your email. It will also leak all of your metadata. We use OTR. OTR will encrypt the contents of your communication. It will leak all of your metadata. So we live in a world where the current state-of-the-art solutions to the privacy threat, to the surveillance threat, involves encrypting the content of our communication but leaving the metadata door open. And that is, that is where we are. That is what people are using and advising people to use in earnest, in bad places when they need to do communication. That is not a great solution. The other option for communication is to use things like Gmail and Facebook and assume that Gmail and Facebook might be telling the US government everything about you, but they might not be telling your government everything about you. Maybe that's a valid strategy. I don't know. All of this is to say that we are at this moment where we can all see just by reading the newspaper that the reasons for trying to find solutions to the privacy threat and the surveillance threat and the censorship threat are right there in front of us. We can see the technologies being used against us. We know where a lot of the holes are. What we need are more people like you who care enough about this 
that you're gonna spend some of the effort you put in the open source world on open source tools that address this issue. And not just tools, but the environment in which they exist. I asked you earlier to tell me who's in the room, right? And I asked who's a developer, and a bunch of hands went up. And you know what? Developers are awesome, but developers are not the solution. We have tools that do very good things. They are not being effectively deployed because the layer that we are missing is the documenters, is the translators, is the people who do end user support, the people who take that stuff and actually make it usable to people where they need to use it. We could stop writing code right now and spend the next two years making interfaces better. <laughs> <laughs> translating language, translating uh, projects into languages so that people can actually use them in their native tongue. Native language documentation. Not that jacked up piece of, you know, Google translated junk that you're shipping out the door. Look, everybody in this room speaks English. Everybody in this room has opened up a package and gotten instructions that were written in a language and then translated into English, and those instructions were unintelligible, were incredibly difficult to understand. That's what we're shipping when we ship translated documentation. That's what we're giving people. And it's terrible. We, we give people that stuff and we expect them to be successful with it. That's never going to work. And if we're building tools that we're asking people to use in earnest to allow them to be activists, to protect their lives, you can't give them tools like that. We can't give them tools like that. We have to do better. And the way in which we need to do better is not around adding more features to our software. It's around making that stuff actively usable, removing features, right? I, I don't know who in this room is actively using GPG, but if your interface to GPG has a bunch of options for something called the web of trust, that's a huge user fail, right? There's a whole section of GPG that is unintelligible and unusable to any person, to the average person, even to experts. And we have, we have it in interfaces as a feature. And that's great, it's another feature. But it's a, the feature is a trap, first of all. It's hard to understand, and it is a place where users bog down. So we could go, we could spend the next two years making better interfaces, writing better documentation, and removing features, and we'd be better off than we are today. We would make more progress than if we spent the next two years designing the most awesome you know, secret crypto system to protect all your data from, from the NSA. So that's where, that's where I am right now. That is the, the place where I have come to as I have been reading the news in the last few weeks as I've been trying to observe where the free software community is, what kinds of things we need to build. So you guys in this room are the people who are going to do a lot of that building. It is people exactly like you who make the tools, make them better, make them deliverable to people in hard places doing hard things. You are that engine. And I'm asking you guys, as you think about what your role is in this community, as you think about what your role is in the world, as you read about the threats that, that are going to keep on rolling in, right? Snowden has a mass of documents. This is gonna be in the news for a while. And we're gonna discover new ways that, not just our government, but every government, every government that has access to electricity, two tin cans and some string, is trying to figure out how to monitor those tin cans, right? Every government that has access to any communications technology wants to know what is passing through that tech. And we are the only people in the world who have any hope at all of stopping them. We're the only people in the world who have any hope at all of protecting anybody from that menace because we're the only people who have the numbers and the drive and the skills and the organizing skills especially to come up with solutions to this problem. The policymakers are gonna yell about this for a very short period of time and then they're going to go back to running for re-election. In Newtown, Connecticut, a man walked into a classroom and shot a bunch of children, and the country was outraged. And we all said, this is, has to change. This is the moment. Look at how terrible this is. We are filled with, with rage, and this is the moment to make change. 
And an awful lot of policymakers and politicians stood up and said, yes, this is the moment to make change. Do we have change anywhere? Did anything happen? Exactly. And the answer, the answer is no, and that is, that is the cycle of outrage in politics of our government system, our policy apparatus. We cannot expect policy to save us in this situation. Once you centralize data, once you take data and make a big giant pile of tasty looking delicious user information, somebody is eventually going to get hungry and eat it all up. Right? We, we, we created one-stop shopping for our user data. That's what Facebook is, that's what Google is. We made the Costco of data. <laughs> Come on in, buy this data. It is, you can buy it in bulk. It is dead cheap. It is so efficient to shop here at Costco for people's data. And we gave the NSA a Costco card. And you know what, they're gonna use it. Anytime you build a data Costco, somebody's gonna come along and access that data, either with permission or without. And I'm not talking about your permission because that's not actually relevant to the conversation. Once we decided to do that, once we decided to make the places where the data was centralized, People are going to apply technology to using that data and trying to learn more about us. The solution is not going to come from policy initiatives. The government is always, always, always going to try to learn more about you. That is the nature of what governments do. So that is my pitch to you, right? We live in a place, a moment in time, where there are many, many places, many, many ways in which we are surveilled, in which our communications is channeled and shaped and censored. At the same time, we live at a, at a moment where we have this giant community of people who make communications technology, and we can do something about this. So I hope that as you spend the next few days here at Open Source Bridge talking to each other about the kinds of things you want to do in the world of open source software, that you spend some of that time talking about how you're going to fix the problems that I've been talking about, if you're interested in following this conversation with me, that's how you get in touch with me. I will be here for a day or two, and I would love to talk to anybody in this room that wants to make this problem better. So thank you very much. I don't have much time because I do want to respect the schedule, but I'll take a couple of questions. shutting off the electricity in the affected area. If you have this government willing to take the strong measures, how is any software going to stand up to that? So th that's, a, that's a really good question. The way to think about these issues is not about absolute communications pathways that will always be open under all circumstances. What we usually do when we're, when we're thinking about this is we think about traffic as a opportunity and a cost. And Societies that depend on the internet working pay a huge cost in turning it off. So, you know, in the United States, if we turned off the internet, I, I give us about three days before we start eating each other. <laughs> yeah. We have to look up recipes and all recipes. Exactly. I mean, you know, look, I. I, I, I am I'm a, I'm something of a survivalist, right? I, I, I have this belief that if the apocalypse comes, I will be ready. But you know what? That's only true if the solar cell powering my little computer that has all the information that I think I know but really exists in digital form stays alive. I don't have books anymore. All my books are gone. They're all digitized. If something bad happens, man, we're in trouble. So in America, turning off the internet would be a really difficult thing to do. Whatever problem you would be trying to solve by turning off the internet, you would be trading for civil war. <laughs> and, you know, that's what happens when you separate people from their cat pictures. In, <laughs> in other countries where infrastructure, the basic daily infrastructure of life that government and business and people need to exist and come to depend on, where that infrastructure is more useful, 
the cost of turning off the internet is higher. In places where that infrastructure is less useful, the cost sort of goes down. So every, you know, if you want to tank your economy, yeah, turn off the internet, but then you've got another problem. So one solution here is to try to find places where the kinds of communication we enable is using the same pathways as the kinds of communication that are vital to the running of society so that governments have to make that really hard choice and they'll turn off the communication less often. I don't think we can completely eliminate it if things get bad enough, somebody will throw a switch, but in the short term at least, we'll manage to get our, our communication through more often. There are ways in which te technology is structured so that, so in Egypt, right, do you guys remember in Egypt all the stories about how the government shut down the internet to prevent the activists from organizing? Well, that's not actually what happened. What happened was the government shut down the firewall separating the network in Egypt from the rest of the internet. And so it became impossible to send a packet from Egypt to America and back. And because tons and tons of people in Egypt were using American services like Google and Twitter to do their communication, they were cut off from each other. Neighbors couldn't talk to neighbors because they couldn't send messages to the United States and back. That was a problem, right? So the response to this was to, you know, form communications networks and take over websites that were hosted in Egypt and do your communication locally. But we broke all of the social contacts and people had to reform those relationships. There was a huge sort of organizing cost as people had to re-agree on what the communications infrastructure was gonna be, re-establish identity, re-establish trust. This was a huge problem. It was solvable, right? Despite the fact that the government had decided to cut off this communication at the borders by talking directly to each other, by building infrastructure that is less centralized, less dependent on, on crossing places that are difficult to cross. Once we did that, we started building more robust communication. And that's the kind of stuff that we can do now. Those are the kinds of techniques that we are learning to use. Every time there's one of these crises, people get together and take a bunch of notes about what's happening and try to figure out how we can do better, what the tech needs to do better next time to support the people in those crises. So yeah, it is not quite as hopeless as you put it. Um, there are things we can do to provide people with meaningful protection and with meaningful access to international communication and uncensored communication, even in hard times. And you know what? The backup plan is build our own network, right? <laughs> there are a bunch of mesh networking projects out there, um, you know, people who want to hoist mylar balloons and bounce signals off them and all that other kind of stuff. And I don't know how, how close we are to getting any of those off the ground in a really difficult situation, but I'll tell you that we're pretty close in a couple places. We're gonna, we're gonna start having some of our own pipes in a few places and we'll use them when we have to. So I think I have time for maybe one more question. Two more questions, two more minutes. Last question, who wants it? Yes. Yeah, I mean, look, so right now we live in a world where in order to be a functioning and successful open source project, the number of things that you are expected to do well is unreasonable. A two-person or three-person or five-person project will never have the skills and the time to actually hit all of those marks. Platforms that allow you to do documentation better, infrastructure that allows us to provide resources on a multi-project level are the next step in organizing. That's one of the things we're building at the Open Internet Tools Project, right? We look at the translation issue and we think this looks terrible because every project has to recruit its own set of translators in every language on Earth. That is not workable. To recruit and then manage that population doesn't make sense. We are recruiting a community of translators to roam from project to project and provide help to those projects on an ongoing basis. In the same way that you currently attach yourself to a project as a developer, we're trying to find translators who want to attach themselves to a translation community. So that instead of 
living in a world where developers are rock stars and translators are support, they can live in a world where translators are rock stars, which I think is a better world to live in if you're a translator. So that's the kind of stuff we want to build and using existing platforms and technology and building on top of them as part of that community is definitely part of the plan. So yeah, I, I think, I don't, I'm not familiar with Duolingo um, specifically. I've heard of it, but I haven't used it. But I, I definitely think that that kind of stuff makes a lot of sense and we should do that. So I am out of time. I really do want to continue this conversation with all of you over the course of this week. Thank you very, very much for listening to what I have to say and I hope to talk to you all soon.